Don't be alarmed, sir. We're just doing a standard check of the area. It's really nothing to worry about. Just make sure you lock your doors tonight. Lock all windows and just keep yourself safe. Please God, let something hold her up and stop her from entering the house. A knife at your throat, a man in your house, an escape plan, maybe? A humiliating experience, the chance to run the terror in that moment. This is your one chance to live. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. <laughs> hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. So, first of all, I'm just going to say amazing response to the Patreon episode that I put up. So many of you got in touch to talk about how fascinated you were by the story of Teresita Bassa. So, if you want to hear that story, it's on my... uh, Patreon. Also, the Eugenia Fellini episode, that brought, whoa, a huge range of responses. And in particular, I would like to thank Tina, who got in touch by email to say that as a transgender female, she felt that the episode was fair and that I told the story with respect and with kindness. Now, You know, I'm not going to lie here, right? Every now and then, I find a story and I think, okay, this sits a little bit outside of the normal, you know, maybe true crime world or story world. And I have to really think, I have to really have a meeting with myself where I sit down and I think about the story and I think about how to tell it. And should I tell it? Am I am I placed politically correctly to tell this story? I've said this like lots and lots of times. Lots of true crime podcasts and lots of um yeah, story based podcasts will will tell, you know, horrific stories that have happened to a woman. You know, something that a woman has been subjected to. And often those they give me pause for thought. They don't I don't I don't just blithely run into those stories and think, oh yeah, great, I'm going to tell that one. I always have that little moment with myself where I go, am I, should I be telling this story? Because I'm not a female, so am I properly going to understand the perspective of it? And then usually I go through a process where I talk to myself about it and then I go, actually, yeah, okay, you are in the right place to tell this story. So it's good to know that people who can identify with Eugenia Fellini have come to me and said, I felt you told that respectfully. I mean, I was really nervous putting that story out. I really was. Just a couple of shout-outs here. So, I'm going to shout out Tara Saraban. Now, Tara is one of the hosts of the brilliant and the hilarious Bloody Murder podcast. I can't even say Bloody Murder without laughing because it is so good such a great podcast but Tara I'm just saying thanks for getting into my corner when I needed it it's nice to have backup when you feel like you need it so thank you Tara alright also Chelsea and Hugo who are in Australia Chelsea is Australian and Hugo I believe is Irish So in my best accents, that would be shout out to 
Chelsea <laughs> and Hugo. No, <laughs> that was Scottish. Hugo. <laughs> oh, that was a terrible Irish accent. I'm sorry about that. Chelsea and Hugo. Hello. Stephanie Bergeron. Hello, Stephanie. Okay, so just a couple of quick shout outs because I have a recommendation. It is a TV show. And I don't know if you get this in other countries outside of the UK. I'm pretty sure you might be able to find it online. It's called 24 Hours in Police Custody. Okay, why is it so good? Well, I will tell you. It's set in a police station in Luton, just outside of London. And Luton is pretty... <laughs> it's pretty crimey. There's a, there's a lot going on. And in each episode, this is what makes it so fucking brilliant. In each episode, there's just... You watch that hour where the police have 24 hours to either make an arrest or let someone go. So it'll show you the crime, and the crimes, they range wildly, week to week. I think one of the ones last week, there was a, a drug ring, where there was 17, 18 year old boys were being used to sell drugs in the street, but the police only had 24 hours to find the man at the absolute top of the tree. There's one in this series where a woman's dead body is found in a field, and police have only got 24 hours to prove who they think did it. It's utterly edge of your seat viewing. It's insane. Whether or not you, like, I'll be honest with you, see the drug episode. It started and I was a bit like, oh, drug rings, don't really know if I'm going to be into this. See, within 10 minutes, I was like, I'm hooked and I need to know how the next 24 hours pan out for police. It's just a brilliant, brilliant example of good police work and sometimes how frustrating it is for police when they know they've got the right person and they just can't get the answers and the clock is ticking down all the time. So that's a Channel 4 programme in the UK called 24 Hours in Police Custody. All right, are we ready for the story? Ready for this one? Okay, let's go. Okay, where are we? Who are we? What the hell is going on? Right, this story takes place in Minnesota. And it's 1997. Now, we're going to meet the main players in this story in a second. But we need to know, first of all, what leads up to them becoming the main players in the story. On August 17th, 1997, a prison van was transporting three male prisoners from one prison to another a few miles away. And that was due to overcrowding in prisons. So the particular prison they were in, they had to be moved due to overcrowding. So, on the morning of the 17th, the van sets off with the three male prisoners in the back of the van. So right, just to be absolutely clear about the setup here, there is a driver in the front, there's a prison guard in the back to accompany the three male prisoners. So you've got five people in total in that van. It's kind of one of these things where, like, depending on the threat level, often there can be more guards. And, uh, you know, like, prisoners who are considered to be big threats they'll be handcuffed to a particular part of the van to ensure that there is no way of escape. No risks get taken in these situations. However, in this case, these three prisoners in Minnesota, 
they were risk assessed and they weren't deemed to be dangerous. They'd been in for like drugs, petty theft, a little bit of violence here and there, but nothing too serious that would come under the banner of serious crime. So the van leaves, but what the driver and the guard don't know is that these three prisoners have a plan, and their plan is to get free. This is their chance, they think. This is it. It's now, or it's never. Working as a team on the journey, the three prisoners overpower the guard, first of all, in the back, and then the driver. And what actually happens is they cause the van to crash. And all three of those prisoners, they escape. Luckily, the driver and the guard, they've only got really kind of minor injuries. But right now, Minnesota has a massive problem on its hands. It's got three escaped prisoners running around a suburb somewhere in Minnesota. Pretty scary stuff. Now, and this is fast police work. The three prisoners split up. They go their own separate ways. And by 4pm that afternoon, two of them are caught and back in prison. Well done, the police in that situation. Well done to have captured two of them that quickly. But that still leaves one prisoner at large running around the place. And this is the one prisoner we need to know about. Okay, let's go now to a street nearby where the prison van escape happened. And let's go to the home of Gordy and Betty Hoffius. Gordy and Betty are both in their early 60s and they've lived in Minnesota all of their lives. And so what happens is Gordy comes home on this day. He drives in to his street. It's like a lovely street, like lots of really nice houses, really well-kept gardens, you know, a nice community. All the neighbours know each other. Lovely. But he notices that a police car is parked in his street and he wonders why? What the hell is going on? And as he drives into his driveway, a police officer stops him and explains there is a convict on the loose from a nearby prison and he should stay vigilant. The police officer says, don't be alarmed, sir. We're really just doing a standard check of the area. It's really nothing to worry about. Just make sure you lock your doors tonight. Gordy says, okay, he will. And he goes inside. When inside the house, he is greeted by a terrifying sight. There is a man standing in his living room. A man he doesn't recognise and who he can only describe as tall, unshaven, with long hair and covered in tattoos. And this man, this creeps me out. This man standing in the living room is wearing Gordy's clothes. 
The stranger is also holding a large kitchen knife. When Gordy can get over his shock and ask who the man is or what the hell is he doing standing in his living room, the man calmly explains that he escaped prison earlier that day and that Gordy should stay calm. Stay calm? <laughs> Yeah, sure mate, sure, yeah, I'll stay calm, for fuck's sake, stay calm, if I walked into my house and there was a stranger wearing my clothes standing there who was saying to me, yeah I escaped from prison earlier on, I'm holding a knife but just stay calm, you'd be like, what the fuck, are you, are you kidding me on, yeah, oh my god, stay calm, even more worryingly than stay calm. The stranger says to Gordy, I haven't killed yet in my life, but that's not to say that I won't. Mm. Now, I bet you're wondering this because I was. How in the hell, right, were police outside of Gordy's house a second ago and now this is happening? Well, very simply, police didn't check the inside of anybody's properties. What they did was, I mean, and I can kind of get this because they would obviously have had a huge area to cover. They checked the gardens, they checked the alleyways, you know, they checked all of these bits, streets, but they just never checked the inside of the houses. And unfortunately, that's where the escaped prisoner was. So Gordy is terrified. Of course he is. Absolutely terrified. But he has one other major concern and that is his wife Betty. It's nearing six o'clock and this is the time of day every day when Betty returns home from work and Gordy is thinking please God, let something hold her up and stop her from entering this house. But Betty does arrive home. She gets out of the car. She goes into the house and when she walks into the living room, She doesn't see the stranger in the living room straight away. The first thing that she notices is that Gordy is sitting in what is her chair in the living room. She thinks that's odd, but she kind of shakes the thought. She bends down to pat the dog. And when she stands back up, there is a knife at her throat. She realises that there is a man holding a knife at her throat who has a wrench in the other hand. Oh, I cannot imagine what that moment of shock and fear must feel like. The prisoner in their home, he marches them both into the kitchen and he sits them down at the kitchen table. He tells them he will kill them if they do not obey him. They must do whatever he asks. All the while, he's holding a knife to Betty's throat. They're obviously, like, terrified beyond belief. And they're just in complete shock. I think it's really important to not underestimate shock. Because I don't think shock goes away (laughs) quickly. I don't think it does. Shock's one of those things that can last for hours and hours. And I'm pretty sure at that moment, Gordy and Betty were in, yes, a place of absolute terror but just also 
in shock. How is this happening in their house? So this guy starts to talk to them and he tells them that he has been, in his own words, a loser all of his life and that there is no way he's going back to prison. So in order to try and like keep things calm, Betty and Gordy, they do whatever he wants. So he says, right, I want coffee. And Betty makes it instantly for him. She just goes and makes coffee straight away. He says to Betty and Gordy, do you have guns? And they say, no. He asks them, do you have drugs? And they say, no. Gordy, at this point, he starts to offer the man things to leave. Like, he's saying to him, I can give you money. I, I can give you my watches. I'll give you my car. Just anything, anything that will get this guy out of their house. I mean, I I understand that. I think I would do the exact same. I think I'd be like, you can have anything in my life. Well, except Alfie, my dog. You can't have him. But <laughs> I think I'd be like, you can have whatever you need at this moment to just get away from here. But none of it worked. He wanted guns and he wanted drugs. So he keeps asking Betty for coffee. She keeps making him more and more coffee. He is now out of his face on caffeine. He is drinking crazy amounts of it. And he has these like weird bursts of activity. Well, I say weird bursts of activity. It's not really. It like I drink a lot of coffee, probably too much coffee. And you know, like sometimes you catch yourself and you're a bit like, oh my God, I am literally chattering like a budgie on cocaine. But I think coffee can do that to you. It can just make you feel a bit drunk, a bit weird if you've had too much. Now, the things that he's saying to them are not good. They are fucking terrifying. He starts talking to Gordy and Betty about how he has previously lured young girls into abandoned buildings and raped them. And then he starts boasting that he has masterminded thefts all across Florida. He tells him about times where he has threatened people with guns. Now, real talk, not real talk, just just about a big talk. Who knows? But I feel like if there was a prisoner in my house, he was telling me these things, I wouldn't for a second be looking into his eyes like I disbelieved that. Because why would you? That's a risk. So Gordy now thinks, right, okay, well, you've not taken the offer of money or a car. And he thinks, I'll tell you what, I can tell you how to get out of town without being caught. And he's making it really clear to him. He's saying, right, so you go to this road, you don't go down this road, and then you keep driving for another mile, two miles, or whatever, and you will not be seen by anyone. This is this is your escape route. But he says, no. He says to Betty and Gordy, I'm going to stay here until 5am when the police change shifts and there's a new set of officers because the ones looking for me will be getting off work and the new ones won't know where to start. He says the police are stupid. Right, this is 8pm in Betty and Gordy's house and this guy is saying I'm going to be here until 5am. Fuck me. All the while the 
Guy is still holding the knife to Betty's throat. And it's clear, I think, that he thinks that's the power in the situation. He thinks if I can hold the knife to Betty's throat, then I'm in charge. And Gordy says something that just breaks my heart. Oh, He says, I wanted to throw myself at him so badly and wrestle him to the ground. But I'm 60 and I couldn't overpower him. And I knew that. I just didn't want to die in front of Betty. So this guy then demands that Betty and Gordy go through to the living room. And they turn on the TV. He wants to see the news. And of course, on the news, there he is. It's the top story on the news. Escaped convict has not been found. Two others have been found, but one is still at large. Can you imagine what Betty and Gordy must have felt at that moment? You're watching. That weird, like, detachment feeling. (laughs) Like, they're watching it going, we're sitting in the presence of the man that they are talking about on the news. This absolute prick of a man has the audacity to say when he sees himself on TV, I look really good. Oh, fuck you, mate. So at this point, Betty and Gordy, they don't know his name. But the news announces his name. And it's Homer. So, something here, right, just to pause for a second. Something weird jumped out at me here because I have a strange... Either memory that I've heard this, or I've read it somewhere... But I think, if I'm really not wrong, I think if you know the name of your attacker or your kidnapper, then increases your chances of survival. I could be entirely wrong. I know that sounds really odd, And I'm not talking about, like, if a stranger grabs you off the street and holds a knife at your throat and, you know, you get away wherever you can. But I'm sure there's something that's been published about psychology that says if you can know the name of your attacker or the person who's holding you captive or whatever that is, you have a better chance of survival. I might be making this up, but I don't think I am. (laughs) I'll do some research. (laughs) So I'm just out talking off the top of my head. I'll do some research and I'll get back to you about that. Anyway, Homer, now sitting in the living room, makes Gordy turn over the TV to his favourite TV show. Now, I would never laugh out loud when I'm looking at a case where two 60-year-olds are being held captive by an escaped prisoner in their house. But I did when I got to this part. Homer... (laughs) Homer wanted the TV turned over so that he could watch Murder, she wrote. Actual Murder, she wrote. I sort of laugh because here's the man who thinks that he's like this big time criminal and all he wants is to watch 
Jessica Fletcher. Obviously in that moment, for Gordy and for Betty, they're just feeling pure terror. Sheer stress like you would not know. I just sort of laughed about this detail slightly because <laughs> I'm I'm not a cool person <laughs> in any way <laughs> whatsoever. But Murder She Wrote is one of my obsessions. I mean, I really border on obsession with it. So much so that, like, I would get Christmas gifts sometimes <laughs> wrapped in, like, <laughs> Murder She Wrote wrapping paper. One birthday, I got a framed photo of Jessica Fletcher. Oh, God. I'm actually cringing at myself. I'm so embarrassing. Honestly, I, I swear now, I mean, maybe not so much now, but years ago, I was so obsessed with Murder, She Wrote. And if I watched it with someone else and they asked, like, an innocent question, like, oh, who's that random female character? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, my God. That's Loretta. She works in the Cabot Cove Laundrette. She's the town gossip. <laughs> Why don't you know who she is? I remember once, right, sitting watching, this is so bad, sitting watching Murder, She Wrote with my friend Anna, <laughs> and she asked me, so, is Jessica a spinster? I was like, oh, for God's sake, Anna. No, her husband Frank died, leaving her a widow. That is Jessica's tragedy. Why don't you understand this? And she looked at me and was literally like, babe, you've got to take this way less seriously. <laughs> Which I have. <laughs> what a fucking loser. Oh man, can't believe I, I <laughs> confess my actual obsession with Murder, She Wrote. So yes, sorry, that sort of broke the tension slightly, but back to Homer, Gordy and Betty. Things are about to take a darker turn. Homer orders them to both go upstairs to their bedroom and lay down on the bed. And then he follows them to the bedroom. As they lay on the bed, he stands in the doorway and he watches. Homer just basically now starts to parole up and down outside of the bedroom. Now what Gordy is trying to do is he's trying his best to communicate with Betty whenever he can through a lot of whispered conversation. He's saying to her, I think we can escape out of here. But Betty is adamantly saying to him, no, it's too risky. Gordy realises that any plan he might have to try and get him and Betty out of there is probably too risky. And he decides, okay, we'll stay where we are and I'll think of the next plan. But Homer starts to get worried that Gordy might be trying to come up with an escape plan. And what he starts doing next is just horrible. Every time he has to go to the bathroom, he takes Betty from the bed, he holds the knife to her throat, he makes Gordy stand outside of the bathroom door, and while he goes to the toilet, Betty just has to watch. Just humiliating. Just horrible. Just like, just fuck off. Just horrible. But, what could either Betty or Gordy do? So what does Homer decide he's going to do next? Well, this. 
He says to Gordy, okay, I want some of your clothes. I want more of your clothes, because he's already wearing some of Gordy's clothes. He says, I want more of your clothes, and I am going to dress up as you and escape this house. So he, bearing in mind, I said he had a big long beard, he takes Gordy's electric razor, he tries to cut his beard really short the way that Gordy's is. He breaks the razor. Fucking idiot. He takes Gordy's glasses and cap and he's convinced that dressing as Gordy will be the perfect way to escape. Once he's finally dressed, he turns to them and he says, I have a plan. And the plan involves good news and bad news. The good news is I'm leaving. The bad news is that you are coming with me. Oh man. Just imagine thinking that he was going to leave to be told he's now changing the plan and that he's taking you with him. So he gets Betty and Gordy to the car by holding a knife to Betty's throat. And inside the car he puts Betty in the back and he ties her to the seat belts using a really strong tape so that she can't escape. Now, Gordy is in the front seat and he is thinking if there was ever a moment To escape, this has to be it. So Gordy is in the front seat and he is not tied as tight as Betty. So now Homer drives about five minutes down the road from their house. Where the fuck does this guy think he's going with these two in the car? I don't understand. Like I don't get why he thinks this is a good escape. All the time that they are driving, Gordy is in the slowest way that you possibly can, trying to not be detected. He's trying to undo the ropes. And Homer, thankfully, does not see this. After about 20 minutes of driving, Homer stops at a garage to get cigarettes thinking, well, these two are entirely trapped within the car. I'll nip in, get some cigarettes, come back out, fine. When he is out of the car, Gordy turns to Betty and he says, I'm free of these ropes and we have to run now. Betty hesitates at first, terrified. But Gordy pulls her from the car. He drags his wife by the arm out of the car and he drags her out of the garage parking lot and up onto the main highway when he gets there he leaves Betty at the side of the road and oh man love this guy love him he goes into the middle of the highway with all the speeding traffic and he tries to flag down a car Gordy says he knows that if you stand at the side of the road, no one's going to stop. You have to, if you really want someone to stop for you, get to the middle of the road. That's when a person will know you are in real danger. So a car stops. Thank God. Gordy quickly explains that he and his wife need help now. They need it now. Like there's no fucking hanging about. There's no hesitating. They need to get to a police station immediately. And the driver, who has stopped for them, takes them to the first police station that they can find. This was the journey to the police station after 14 hours of being held by Homer. Gordy and Betty, they tell their story at the police station. And the search for Homer 
begins. Homer, of course, in the meantime, has returned to the car, realised his prisoners are gone, so he panics, he takes the car, and he flees. Three days pass. Gordy and Betty, they stay with their family in that time. They're scared to return to their house. But, after three days, Homer is found, and he's sent straight back to prison. He's charged with kidnap and with putting Betty and Gordy through hell. So the couple, they go about rebuilding their life as best they can. Homer gets a 10 year sentence but he is released after 5. Now, I just think for Betty and Gordy, that must have been a real concern because if that had happened in your life, well, I know what I would do. I would be checking all the time about that person and when they were getting out of prison. But after five years, he's out. It must be really scary to go the criminal who has actually terrorised you, is free, but also knows where you live has been in your house before. However, out of prison, things, they don't go well for Homer. He returns to a life of crime. And during one of his crime sprees, he steals a car, he's chased by police, and it results in a car crash in which Homer dies. Betty and Gordy now talk at national events about survival and their experience. I mean, they've recovered entirely. Well, maybe not entirely, but they've recovered from that horrific experience in their home. And they say that they forgive Homer for the experience. And so ends this short story. Ah, a horrible one. It's just one of those ones where it's about time, place, circumstance, and it just, everything just collides together. Good on, Gordy and Betty, for taking a terrible experience and turning it into a way that they can make it good. Alright, that's the story done. The episode done. I'll just leave you by saying if you do want to support the podcast, I'm on Patreon. And there are episodes that are only available on Patreon. And if you could listen to them, I would love that. I know I sound like a broken record, but the Facebook group is going through the roof at the moment. And the chat on there is so good. It's hilarious. If you're one of the people posting in the group, thank you so much. Twitter, Instagram, I'm there if you want to get me. So, until the weekend. Okay, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.